Perfect. Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's CryoEM practice webinar. For today's webinar, we're recording and you'll be able to find today's talk along with all of our past talks on our YouTube page or events page at cryoemcenters.org. You're joining the three national centers established by NIH Common Fund Transportive High Resolution CryoEM, sorry, Cryo Electron Microscopy Program. I am Lauren Vega and I'm project coordinator for Pacific Northwest Center, Cryo, Northwest CryoEM Center at PNCC. Oh, wow. Um, with me today are Ed Eng and Angelique Saw from National, National Center for CryoEM Access and Training, NCCAT, and we are missing our third representative from Stanford Slack CryoEM Center. So this webinar series is hosted regular on, like, regularly on the last Thursday of every month, focusing on CryoEM. Along with exciting biology, these talks highlight the methods and research groups uh, and research groups used to obtain and interpret cryoEM data they collect with our National Center resources. We do hope these talks are useful, especially for groups just starting out in cryoEM. So for today's speaker, um, Francesca Valise, it, uh, she was invited by NC Katz, and Angelique will introduce her properly after each of the National Centers gives a quick update on the cryoEM resources they have available at no cost to the research community. And then regarding our next talk, um, in July, uh, this will, or July 21st, um, that we will be hosting Samoya Joseph, a postdoctoral fellow with David Dr. Campbell at University of Iowa, who will tell us about their work on the structure and mechanism of large one mitroglycan polymerase. So with that, I am going to let Ed actually introduce the first cry or the first cryo national center. S2C2. Okay, uh, for my colleague Mike at S2C2, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the, off, uh, the services offered. They offer service projects for CREOS access, screening, freezing, exploratory access, and training. They have three Titan CREOSes, alpha, beta, and gamma, with energy filters and direct detectors, as well as another CREOS in Arctica for training and specimen preparation. If you go to that website, they actually just updated their link. So when you uh, update your bookmarks, please follow that link, which will come soon. <laughs> so sorry, Mike, if I didn't do a better job. Thanks, Ed. Uh, so back to me covering for Pacific Northwest Center for CryoEM. So we offer two proposal types. We have a screening access proposal for up to five days of on-site sample preparation and optimization targeted towards low resource institutions or people just getting their feet wet with CryoEM. We then have a general access for single particle analysis or tomography, um, which gives up to 480 hours a year which, and is valid for up to two years. So approved general access proposals are eligible for all of our training workshops. And at PNCC, we have a monthly submission deadline for our application. Each approved proposal that we have is delegated a SPOC or scientific point of contact that you can ask scientific questions. We also have five scopes. We have an Arctica with K3. We have four Creoses with K3 and Falcon 3 cameras. Three of our Creoses have been equipped with energy filters and three have been upgraded to fringe free. And then for sample preparation, we have a VitroBot and Leica GP2. And then lastly, I wanna mention that we're again, able to have visitors again, we're super, super happy. We're actually hosting our microscope operation workshop um, this week and last week. And then our next onsite workshop is gonna be our sample preparation in September. So if you're a general access proposal um, that has been approved, feel free to apply to that one. And then going back to Ed. Okay, so at NCCAT here in New York, we offer uh, CREOS access on one of our four dedicated uh, instruments. We offer grip preparation and screening, making use of our chameleon or vitrification glacios instruments, and a robust cross-training program. I want to point out, if you're going to be in Portland next month, both ACA and m, &M are having a joint day where you can cross-register. The last day to register for the ACA meeting is July 8th, and for the ACA, there will be no on-site registrations. Why that's important, all the centers are hosting workshop five, how you can learn cryom specimen preparation using cryom merit badges, and that'll be hosted by PNCC at PNCC on workshop Friday at the ACA. So please find out more at nccat.nyspc.org, and I hope to see you in Portland. 
perfect. Thanks, Ed. And I just want to remind everybody that is attending today um, to use the Q&A button to send your questions at any time during the talk or upvote questions you see there. And then I believe that Angelique will be moderating questions at the end of the talk. So with that, I'll turn it over to Angelique to introduce our speaker. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Angelique Sa. Um, I'm over here at NYSBC with NCCAT, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Francesca Valisi. She completed her PhD and performed her postdoctoral research at the University of Padova in Italy, where she used many biochemical and structural techniques to study a large number of fundamental biological processes, including iron-iron hydrogenase maturation, mitochondrial calcium unipore, and proteins involved in the patho um, pathogenous uh, pathogenicity, yeah, sorry, pathogenicity of the human gut pathogen, H. pylori. She came to New York in 2019 to join Oliver Clark's lab as an associate research scientist at Columbia University. During the pandemic, she pivoted her research to the needs of the moment and collaborated with Columbia Presbyterian Hospital for the development of the antibody screening for SARS-CoV-2. And she helped in the screening of physicians and patients. She is currently involved in the structural characteristic characterization of the patient um, of the plasma membrane protein complexes purified from human erythrocytes, in particular the N-chiron 1 complex, which is also the subject of this seminar. Understanding these structures has significant implications both for our understanding of erythrocyte membrane protein organization and more broadly in how N-chirons act to nucleate clusters of membrane proteins in other cell types and tissues. Aside from her accelerating scientific career, she was also a lifeguard. She ran five marathons. She walked across Italy with her sister. And to top it off, she went on the top of Monte Rosa Glacier where she nearly died of hypothermia during a snowstorm. And her excitement continues today as we are actually currently screening and processing her data on the glacios at NYSBC while she presents the architecture of the human erythrocyte and Chiron 1 complex for all of us. So here is Francesca Valisi. Thank you very much, Angelica. I am started the sharing of my screen. Okay, I'm sorry, I start from a little bit far. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Korean National Center for having me here. And actually, I need to give a big thanks to the NCCAT because uh, actually my first approach with the CryEM started uh, uh, in uh, 2020 when I was uh, one of the participants to the single particle analysis short course. A lot of things uh, changed during this uh, two year and a half. First of all, uh, three days after this picture, there was uh, the New York shutdown. And the second thing is that uh, actually my approach uh, with the CRIAM went pretty well. So, and today uh, I'm started to share with you some of uh, our recent data on the structure, uh, structural characterization of the human uh, um, erythrocytes and killing one complex. So the red blood cells are the most abundant cells that you can find in the blood. They have a critical role in the transport of respiratory gases, oxygen and CO2 uh, between the lungs and the tissues. And they have this characteristic of concave shape that provides an optimal surface to area ratio for the exchange of the gases. They are very flexible and they can pass through very small capillaries. The shape and the flexibility of the red blood cells is provided by a spectrin acting in cytoskeleton. In this beautiful negative stain image from the 1987, you can see this particular spectrin acting pattern uh, that is like a, an hexagonal pattern in which you can identify two major complexes. The junctional complex here, that is uh, the one that is responsible for the um, uh, to put together multiple uh, spectrum tetramers and uh, the anchoring complex uh, here that uh, has a double rule. The first one to, is uh, to attach uh, the cytoskeleton to the membrane via a direct interaction between anchoring and spectrin. And the second one uh, is uh, to mediate the cluster of functionally related uh, membrane proteins that are in the plasma membrane. 
uh, it's important for you to remember that uh, this arrangement is not just erythrocyte specific. Actually, uh, spectrin optin network interacts uh, with ankyrin also in other cell line, for example, in neuros, cardiomyocyte, epithelial cell, and also skeletal muscles. Um, most of the components of this complex are well characterized from the biochemical point of view since the 1950. We know, for example, we knew, for example, that Bentry was one of the components of this complex. Uh, is an anion exchange that transport chloride and bicarbonate uh, in a bidirectional way. Then we have um, the, and this expressed at the dimer or possibly a tetramer. We have protein 4.2 that uh, regulates the Bentry and Dunkirin interaction. We have Ankirin that is uh, the um, scaffold uh, that mediates all this interaction and uh, glycophorin A. There are other uh, uh, components uh, that uh, we think people thought uh, can be there like RHAG, uh, glycophorin B, LV, CD47. Um, Mutation in most of the expected components of the complex are related to a severe form of anemia called hereditary spherocytosis. So this also shows us that there is a direct um, relation between the anchoring complex and the shape of the erythrocytes, because in the case of this mutation, the erythrocytes have a banana shape and they are not anymore like a disc, but they are like a Ferrocytes. And these ferrocytes are very fragile and are rapidly degraded by the spleen. Um, has been proposed in the past that anchoring one complex form a CO2 metabolome. So it's able to keep together proteins that are involved in the gas exchange across the red blood cell membrane. Um, if you have a look at some of the components or the proposed components of the complex, is a pretty clear why. Because, for example, we knew uh, that carbonic anhydrase interacts with the C terminus of Bentry, and uh, carbonic anhydrase is responsible for the conversion of CO2 and water into uh, bicarbonate and uh, protons. We have Bentry that mediates the anion exchange of this chloride and bicarbonate. We have a RHAG that facilitates the ammonia diffusion and also the consequent modulation of the uh, protons and the pH of the red blood cells. And we have RHC that could, involve, could be involved in, in the diffusion of uh, uh, CO2. But uh, we are sure, we were not sure about the components if uh, these were just the components of the complex, if there were other components. We were not sure about the stoichiometry of this complex, uh, how ankyrin is able to bind to the membrane, because usually ankyrin can be a soluble protein in the presence of the autoinhibitory motif, and how this complex is related uh, and um, with the membrane curvature of the red blood cells. To try to answer to this question, we decided to structurally characterize the complex uh, directly from the red blood cells. So um, the organizer asked me to go a little bit in detail um, on uh, the, the preparation of this sample. So I started from, I want to start from the beginning. So from the preparation of the gas membrane, uh, I start to optimize these protocols uh, a few years ago when I was still in Italy, uh, working on another target, but uh, actually um, was uh, very challenging because usually the, protocols are well um, are well described but usually they start from a few microliter or from a couple of ml of blood but actually for my protocols uh, i decided uh, to, because i need a lot of material to start from a few liters usually between three and six liter of um, concentrated red blood cells uh, was not easy but uh, then finally i realized what i want uh, that were the ghost membrane that are these white uh, and fluffy membrane that are very different from the membrane that you expect uh, usually from the cells and uh, this uh, is just uh, um, the protocol is pretty easy you just make uh, uh, thanks to an hypotonic solution make uh, the erythrocyte just explode they release uh, all the hemoglobin that is giving the red color and you just separate the ghost plasma membrane that are the plasma membrane 
of uh, the erythrocytes. Another important step uh, in uh, the development of my protocol was uh, the identification of the right uh, um, detergent. Actually, I tried a lot of different detergent. Some of them uh, were well characterized for the erythrocytes, such as, tri as Triton and the C12V8. Other are just common detergent that you have in your lab, like DDM, DDM CHS, uh, DM, uh, OG. Uh, and I also decided to use some mild detergent, uh, even if very expensive, uh, as digitonin. Uh, here, I just uh, show you a couple of these, uh, the one that gave me a very similar uh, uh, solubilization um, uh, material. Uh, if you compare, uh, for me, it was pretty easy to compare one to the other because there are a couple of uh, uh, proteins uh, that uh, have a uh, uh, very well-known pattern like Bentry or Ankinin. So if you compare the solubilization between uh, the different detergent uh, was almost the same. But then uh, I uh, ran on a size exclusion chromatography column, uh, the solubilized uh, material. And uh, you can see that uh, in the blue curve, uh, that uh, is the one uh, of the uh, digitonian solubilization material. Um, we have a ratio between uh, the low molecular weight and the high molecular weight species that is in favor of the high molecular weight one. So I decided to move on digitonin. And actually, uh, before move on that, uh, I also check uh, if my sample was good uh, with a uh, uh, very useful negative stain. And you can see here that you see this kind of uh, nano disc shape uh, material all around. And also the material seems not to aggregate, so it was very good. And here, just the uh, um, brief uh, uh, um, schematization of the purification protocol. So with the GOS membrane that are solubilized with digitonin, then uh, since uh, clearly um, purifying something directly from uh, the red blood cells uh, and not uh, using an, an heterologous system as E. coli of the mammalian cells, uh, I don't have protein overexpressed uh, with that tag. So I use another system just uh, based uh, on the size of the protein because I was expecting that uh, my complex uh, was at least uh, one megadalton. So the first um, step was to use a glycerol gradient. Thanks to the glycerol gradient, uh, I identify on the bottom of the gradient where we expected to have the molecular weight species. Um, this uh, mm, sample, I took this fraction and uh, I ran uh, this fraction through a super 6 gel filtration column. And this is the profile that I obtained with uh, a main peak and uh, this nice uh, shoulder. Um, another instrument that was very helpful in my case uh, was the mass photometer from a defined company that allow you to identify the uh, molecular weight of your sample. So in my case, I used the sample from the beginning to the end just to know exactly uh, the molecular weight uh, or the mix of different molecular weights uh, of the proteins that were in my solution. So for the first peak, uh, the big one, around 12 ml, we identified a species that was around 400 kilodalton that uh, we know are uh, band 3 plus GPA, that is around 235 kilodalton plus uh, the digiton in my cells. While for the second one, we were very happy because we identify this uh, very nice uh, um, species around 1.2 megadalton. So we took together this fraction and uh, we froze uh, a couple of grids. I want to give you another tip that was uh, very important for us was the um, addiction of uh, the glycolytic acid that we friendly call GA um, just before freezing and uh, is uh, of the saponin family and are from the roots of the licorice. licorice. And if you compare uh, actually the two samples uh, without uh, GA and with GA, you can see from the micrograph that in the case of GA addiction, the uh, particles uh, are much nicer. And also if you compare the CTF between the two, you can see the same. So, um, we collect uh, a good amount of uh, micrograph, more than 40,000 with the uh, CRIOS. And here, one of the representative micrographs uh, in which you can see the particles uh, in different orientation. And these are the first uh, 50 2D classes that we obtained from the first uh, um, blob picking. 
And uh, it's clear uh, immediately looking at the 2D classes and as also as expected uh, that uh, we, we, we had uh, multiple, uh, um, multiple species, something quite small here in the red box and uh, some big species that are here in the green box. The processing to obtain uh, the structure that I'm going to show you was uh, pretty complicated and uh, I, I, we will need like uh, an entire seminar just to show you the processing, but uh, I will uh, skip that uh, quite fast. And I will just tell you that from uh, 700 particles, we obtain a consensus refinement of 2.3 Armstrong of what we call uh, the core of the complex. Subsequent uh, uh, classification of this core of the complex allow us to identify other six classes that we call class one to six. Uh, today, I will show you just two of these classes. Um, first of all, because they're the most interesting one, and uh, second, because I, know I have not enough time, but um, it's better to start with the first one that is also the one that we think uh, is the most uh, complete uh, complex. And here, this nice movie that show you the complex. We have the intracellular part and the cytosolic part. We have uh, uh, three band three proteins in orange, yellow, and uh, violet. Anchorin in red and protein 4.2 here in green that mediates the interaction of one of the band three. We have the rage complex here in the middle, and we have one glycophorin A for each uh, band three protein. We have also here in light green, you can see in another uh, transmembrane protein, a single transmembrane one that is glycophorin B. As expected, anchorin is uh, the core of this complex. Um, here, there is uh, the structure that we identify. There are three in the vertebrates, anchorin one, two, and three. In the erythrocytes, uh, we have anchorin one. And the anchorins share a common uh, arrangement uh, that consists of 25 anchorin repeat membrane binding domain. That is uh, this one that we also we were able to solve. Then uh, a spectrum binding domain. So you need to imagine that here at the C terminus, actually, there is a, a disorder region. Then there is the spectrum binding module. And then there is a, a Dalton inhibitory motif on the C terminal tail that usually is bound to the uh, this. Um, groove of the protein, but in our case, the groove is occupied by the interaction with the other membrane proteins. Here in the structure, you can see the in uh, uh, salmon color, the membrane binding groove. And you can see here in yellow, we have uh, the peptide coming from uh, the terminus of uh, one of the band three uh, that is binding all along the binding groove. Um, another thing that I want to mention is about uh, the uh, 24 uh, anchorin repeat uh, by, um, region. Uh, these are like uh, composed each of uh, 33 amino acids and uh, two helixes connected by a loop. This is a typical uh, repeat uh, uh, that is coming from anchorin. So if uh, we compare the structure of uh, anchorin 2 that was solved a few years ago in the presence of uh, the auto inhibitory motif, uh, with the one of anchorin one that we sold uh, here, uh, here in blue and uh, in uh, red, it's clear that between the two, there is a, a dramatic uh, rearrangement of the first five anchorin repeat region. And in particular, this rearrangement uh, involved uh, the anchorin repeat five and this between the loop between anchorin repeat five and six. If we compare the sequence of the 24 anchorin repeat, you can see that there are four amino acids that are missing in anchorin repeat five, and there are some mutation in the few amino acids, and these mutations are not present in the other anchorin repeat. And it's also very interesting to compare this region of anchorin repeat five and six between the three anchorins because this region has an identity of 100%. So you can imagine that this kind of rearrangement can happen also for the other two anchorins. So looking again in detail of the and comparing the two uh, see the two structure of anchorin repeat anchorin two and anchorin one. 
you can appreciate more uh, this uh, rearrangement, uh, like a T shape rearrangement of Ankiri 1. And you can see that in case of Ankiri DP2, we have uh, the auto inhibitory motif that is binding all along uh, the binding groove. And uh, while in uh, Ankiri DP1, uh, that is our Ankiri, we have uh, this uh, band three and terminus uh, domain that is going uh, uh, from uh, the beginning of uh, the Ankiri DP3 region until here, that is Ankiri DP6. And it's very interesting to mention that the band tripeptide is oriented in the reverse direction to what uh, was previously observed, observed for uh, the auto inhibitory motif. So here in details, we have uh, the band 3 uh, cytosolic domain, and then uh, we have uh, uh, the end terminus that is going all along the binding groove, and actually um, uh, runs uh, all along the inner groove with the residue 2 to 24 that are forming a um, very ordered interaction with the Ankiri repeat 10 uh, to 6 and also with the region of Ankiri repeat 5 and 6 here. So what is our hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that in case uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, and terminal domain and band 3 is binding to anchoring. This is able to displace uh, the auto inhibitory motif. In this way, uh, the anchoring is able to change its conformation. And uh, actually, this uh, interaction is also stabilizing uh, um, this uh, new conformation. Looking in detail of, um, on how anchoring binds the different uh, membrane target. Uh, in the, this uh, model, I just uh, remove uh, the transmembrane part uh, of uh, the three band three because I'm not involved in, in this interaction. And this makes uh, the image a little bit easier uh, for us uh, to explain. So um, we have, uh, for example, here that is very important that the Ankini repeat region one to five here on the top is interacting, uh, is the one that is directly interacting with the membrane through an interaction with the RHCE and uh, with the N and C terminal domain of C. Then we have uh, here this extended uh, surface uh, that involved the Ankiri repeat one and then Ankiri repeat uh, uh, six to 13 that is involving in, is involved in interaction with the protein 4.2 that works uh, as um, uh, that is oriented vertically and also mediates uh, this interaction with uh, this uh, cytosolic domain of band three one. The second band three that we call band three two uh, is, uh, is interacting with the outer face of Anki repeat uh, 17 to 19. And uh, the third band three that is band three uh, is uh, interacting, is uh, a cytosolic domain is interacting with Anki repeat region 24 to 21. And uh, this uh, is also the uh, cytosolic domain with the end terminus that is going all along uh, the uh, and runs uh, back uh, along the inner group of the alkene. So there are three band trees uh, and, the site, and their cytosolic domain is very mobile. And this is thanks uh, to this uh, loop uh, this, uh, that, um, this, um, that um, mediates the interaction between the transmembrane part and the cytosolic part. And uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, is so flexible that uh, in the case of Bentry 1, that is the one that is interacting with uh, protein 4.2, uh, the cytosolic domain is completely inverted uh, with respect uh, to the membrane. When we compare this uh, with Bentry 2 and Bentry 3, that are the one that directly interact uh, with the Ankeny. But we can uh, also understand why, because uh, Bentry is interacting with uh, different proteins in different uh, places. So, uh, is uh, easy to understand that uh, really this uh, cytosolic domain needs to move a lot. Um, I will spend also a few minutes uh, or less uh, to say something about uh, the um, RH uh, complex, because also this complex, uh, thanks to this uh, structure, was solved for the first time. Uh, there are five humans uh, RH uh, proteins. RH, A, G, C, and D that are the one present uh, in uh, the blood, in the red blood cells, RH, B, G, and C, G that are, uh, and that are in the kidney. 
um, the Rails channel that uh, we were able to solve uh, is uh, an heterotrimer that is formed from uh, by two copies of RHAG here uh, in uh, light uh, and uh, dark blue and a copy of uh, RHCE. RHCE uh, has a very important role because it's the one uh, that mediates the interaction uh, with the uh, anchoring. Um, recently, uh, we also improved the resolution of uh, the RH trimer. And here, just to show you that uh, is uh, pretty nice, uh, we have a 2.1 Armstrong resolution uh, with the mask refinement. And here you can appreciate uh, uh, this nice resolution. And now the second class uh, that uh, was a little bit of a surprise because uh, we identify an unexpected component of the complex uh, that is uh, aquaporin one. Actually, there was uh, some maybe functional data that uh, was possible, uh, uh, an interaction between uh, uh, aquaporin and uh, Bentry, but uh, this is the first time that mm, we were able to see that uh, interaction. This is the map and the model of uh, class two. We have the core of the complex uh, with the uh, Ankirin RH complex uh, and uh, Bentry one. And uh, here we have the aquaporin that actually uh, we were able to solve uh, at a very nice resolution. And uh, here you can appreciate uh, this, uh, the model uh, fit uh, inside the map in which we were able to see also uh, cholesterol for each protomer and also a palmitulation at cysteine 87 that uh, um, was uh, so here for the first time. So aquaporin was not uh, previously known to participate uh, to the erythrocyte anchoring complex, so it's a big surprise, but actually is uh, not just close to the complex, but is located in the mutual interface uh, with the band 3 with the protein 4.2, with the anchoring repeat 1, and with the RHC. So it's actually interacting, and it uh, seems also that this interaction is mediated by some of the lipids that uh, we can see in our map. And also, if you think about the CO2 metabolon that uh, I introduced uh, in, uh, at the beginning, uh, it's easy to see that uh, aquaporin, since it conducts uh, CO2 and water that are both uh, substrate for carbonic anhydrase, it's easy to understand why is a, uh, is a component that makes sense uh, inside uh, this complex. And uh, also, the, I will say something about uh, what is the contaminant, but it's not really a contaminant, it's just a free Bentry, because of Bentry is like a, a represent the 25% of uh, the total of the membrane proteins that uh, you have in the plasma membrane of the red blood cells, and can be uh, both uh, uh, as free Bentry, so not interacting with anything, or part of the anchoring one complex. And here uh, I mentioned in the 2D, cl 2D classification that we saw immediately that there were these classes in the red box. So actually, uh, we were able to solve the structure of the transmembrane part uh, of the free band tree because uh, if it's free, the cytosolic part is very flexible. So we were not able to reach a nice resolution because it was very, very flexible. Uh, we solve uh, the transmembrane part at 2.3 Armstrong uh, in the presence uh, of also uh, glycophorin A. And uh, here you have uh, in light blue and in gray the two protomers. And uh, here in magenta, the glycophorin A. The glycophorin A in, is known to um, have a, a um, regular, regulatory function uh, for uh, Bentry and uh, is uh, typically a dimer. Actually, the structure of the dimer was solved in the past, but uh, is uh, a dimer when it is alone. In this case, uh, is uh, a, a monomer. And uh, actually, the interaction between uh, the Bentry protomer and the GPA is mediated by a cholesterol. Another interesting thing that we saw is here in the interface between, uh, in the dimerization interface between the two protomers, and is the presence of this uh, well ordered lipid. And uh, actually, is in this very positive uh, pocket, uh, and uh, we were able to fit, uh, since the resolution was very good, uh, the PIP2 lipid. 
Uh, as you know, PIP2 is like uh, less than 1% of the total lipids that you can find uh, in the erythrocyte plasma membrane. So usually, and usually is uh, related with uh, some uh, functional, uh, uh, something related with the function or something related with uh, the oligomerization. We are uh, trying to uh, characterize uh, this uh, uh, protein lipid interaction right now. And then also uh, glycophorin B. So glycophorin B was expected uh, from both of the biochemists and also from uh, uh, the mass spec that we, uh, that we did on our sample. But uh, uh, we weren't able to observe that from the initial reconstitution. Uh, Subclassification of class one uh, revealed us that there was uh, this uh, extra helixes and uh, uh, elix, and uh, actually we were able to fit uh, GPB. And it's very interesting because GPB, glycophorin B, uh, is actually mediates an interaction between uh, uh, one of the RHAG and uh, ben uh, ben three three. So we put together of this information some of the information from the literature that were very important for us in all the process. And uh, we actually did uh, an hypothesis of the, um, uh, for the mechanism of formation of this complex. And we have, uh, for example, if you think uh, we have the, uh, in solution, we have uh, anchorin in the presence of the outer inhibitory motif. We have the rage complex that is interacting with the GPB. And then uh, we have one of the band three. If, uh, a RH uh, a complex uh, is in RH complex is going to interact uh, with the Ben3 um, with an interaction mediated by GPB. And in this case, uh, the N terminus of uh, Ben3 can just go and displace uh, the auto inhibitory motif of Ankeny. The displacing of the auto inhibitory motif allow a conformational change in the first five uh, Ankeny repeat uh, region. And uh, this changing put this uh, uh, binding groove uh, available for uh, the interaction with the membrane and actually is able to interact here with the RHCE. And uh, at this point, uh, there is all this surface that is available for the interaction with protein 4.2 that mediates the interaction with band 31 And actually also this part uh, is able to interact uh, with band 32 But uh, it's like uh, that in vivo, the 3 band 3 together with the acuporin uh, are part of the same complex. So this was my slide uh, until two days ago. Now I have this slide in because uh, coming from uh, one of the last, uh, I think that this folder is called final, 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 final. Uh, we were able to finally identify also uh, another three classes. So we are at a total of nine different classes uh, and actually this um, uh, extra one of these extra classes uh, class uh, is very interesting because it show that we have uh, a class in which there is the rate complex the three band three together with also acuporin and a protein that we call X because the resolution is not enough good at this point uh, but we hope to improve the resolution of this uh, small protein uh, so we have uh, all the complex together anyway uh, we decide uh, also to look at this complex uh, um, in, uh, in, in the native membrane, uh, not just uh, to see the entire complex, uh, but also to see if uh, we can see multiple complexes that uh, are uh, um, connected one to the other and how this complex actually is working uh, in relation of the curvature of uh, the membrane. So what I did was to take uh, the Gauss membrane to through a proce procedure of sonication at room temperature, membrane extrusion, uh, uh, pelleting. I was able to obtain uh, these uh, small uh, vesicles uh, that uh, I froze in the thin ice. This is uh, one of the, when we screen this vesicle with glaciers, you can see that it's a very thin ice with a single layer of uh, the, these vesicles. And then uh, we start a collaboration here at uh, CMC with uh, Alex Noble and Jake Johnston, a uh, uh, credit uh, collaboration. And here, one of the tomogram uh, from uh, the vesicle sample, in which you can see these nice vesicles uh, with uh, a lot of proteins uh, in, on the, in the surface. Uh, 
Actually, looking in detail of, uh, to some of the particles that we were able to see on the surface, uh, you can see that uh, the shape resembles what uh, um, some of the classes that we were able to identify from uh, um, the single particle cry -EM that we did. And uh, uh, subtomogram averaging of uh, these uh, particles from uh, the, some of the tomograms that uh, we collected allow us to obtain uh, this uh, subtomogram averaging at uh, 25 Armstrong at this point so far, but uh, I hope that we are going to improve that. Uh, in, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, our model fit perfectly inside uh, this uh, tomogram averaging. In particular, you can appreciate that uh, we can fit uh, perfectly the cytosolic part. So just to conclude, uh, we were able to solve the structure of uh, the Ankyrin-1 complex uh, purified directly from uh, the human uh, red blood cells. We identify aquaponin as a, one of the components of this complex. And uh, thanks uh, to the subtomogram averaging uh, extract directly from the red blood cell membrane, uh, we were able to see that uh, um, um, this complex is present also in native membrane. This uh, is uh, the team during the data collection. Here you can see my PI, Oliver Clark, me, Deninga from uh, the uh, Columbia Cryo uh, team. Um, one of the spare students of a very interesting program uh, that Columbia is doing every summer. Uh, and uh, Laura uh, from Shabalansky Lab now, uh, at that time uh, was uh, in rotation in our lab. And this was the day of the data collection. Uh, I need to say thank you to a lot of people, in particular to my PI, Oliver Clark. He is a great mentor, in particular uh, when we talk about processing. Uh, Cook Ju Kim, that helped me a lot uh, in, to realize uh, some of these uh, amazing figure and uh, the movie that you saw today. And um, my, the Mancha Lab, they are very supportive in everything. Then the people from uh, the CMC Cryo Center, Bob and Zening, uh, Alex and Jake uh, here from the New York Structural Biology Center, and uh, Tito Kali from the University of Padova that is still helping me and provide me the uh, membrane that uh, we use for our experiment. And also, of course, uh, NCCATO for all the support. And uh, thank you for the attention. All right, thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Angelique, um, do you wanna run the Q&A? Sure, so we have uh, two questions in so far. Uh, we have one from Chow and they're asking, sorry if I have missed this, but did you see the G8 in the final map? The G8, sorry, the G8. Yeah, your glycerzic acid. <laughs> oh, but that is just uh, an additive. Okay. So the, maybe I, I, um, I didn't explain very well. We use just uh, as an additive and improve uh, a lot uh, our uh, micrograft. Uh, so, but uh, it's just an additive uh, and um, didn't give any other effect than preserve a little bit our sample and make everything easier for us. Got it. Uh, thank you for your present. This is from Sagar. Thank you for your presentation. Not a question, just a curiosity. If you could please enlighten on your protein production and purification steps. Mm -hmm. What in particular? Sorry. Uh, Sagar, if you want to unmute yourselves and and. Uh... I'm not sure if participants can unmute themselves. I believe I gave them permission. Let's double check that. Yes, Sigar, we're gonna unmute you. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, just if he uh, can go and ask me what he want to know, I will be great. Okay. Or if you can type it in the, the Q&A to clarify what you meant by that. Um, in the meantime, let's go to Anna. 
How did you come up with the idea of adding the GA as an additive? Um, well, uh, to be to say the truth was uh, Oliver Clark uh, that uh, for some reason uh, he was uh, reading this paper that was uh, com were completely unrelated uh, to CryEM. They were talk about the preserve food and they were using this saponin and just uh, Oli came up to why we can't just try this uh, on our sample to see if uh, is able also to preserve our sample from higher water interface damage uh, and um, since uh, it's pretty cheap we just bought that we tried and it worked so um, maybe uh, also without GA I, I don't know. I can't uh, make any hypothesis. For sure, if the resolution uh, is so good, it's also because of this, uh, uh, the GA. Any other questions? So far, we don't have any more except for the cigar question. Going once, going twice. Um, do you want that I stop the sharing of the screen? Sure. Or I keep that. Got it. <laughs> All right. If we don't have any other questions, um, then we can end a little bit early. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us today, and we wish you well in your cryo EM endeavors. The National Centers are here to support your science, so let us know how we can help you, and we hope that you join us again in July. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.